So we had a really nice conjunction of Saturn and Jupiter on December 21st, 2020, and I'll talk about some of my experiences. So for those of you who don't know, a conjunction is when two objects in the sky appear to be very close to one another from our perspective. Because the moon and the planets are constantly moving up there, it's inevitable that conjunctions occur at some point. For example, here's a picture I took from June 30th of 2015 when Venus and Jupiter were in the same field of view. Now, Saturn-Jupiter conjunctions are particularly interesting to us because those are the two best planets to look at through a telescope, and when you can see them both in the same field of view in an eyepiece, it's very exciting. If you can picture the planets as runners going around a track with the sun in the middle, as in this diagram here, you can see the Earth goes around the sun quite quickly. Saturn takes about 29 and a half years to go around the sun. Jupiter takes around 11 or 12. So the closer you are to the sun, the faster you go. Notice Jupiter and Saturn from our point of view appear to be very close together. This is, of course, just an optical illusion. In reality, those planets are nowhere near each other. Jupiter is something like 500 million miles from us, and Saturn is almost twice that distance at pretty close to a billion miles away. But the way they line up in the sky, it appears that they're together. If you notice something else about the diagram, Saturn and Jupiter are on the other side of the Sun, or they almost are. So when things are near the Sun, that means we see them either at dawn or at dusk. And in this case, we see Saturn and Jupiter just after sunset. And in fact, the Sun is pretty close. In very loose terms, you might even call this a triple conjunction between Jupiter, Saturn, and the Sun. Now, because the planets move more or less in a plane, but they're not quite tilted in the same incline from that plane, these conjunctions are relatively rare. But if you miss this one, there's going to be another one in 20 years. And every 20 years or so, there's another good Saturn-Jupiter conjunction. So if you miss the one in 2020, if you're around in 2040, you can see another one, 2060, and so forth. If you happen to be around in 2080, that's going to be another really good conjunction. So one thing that made this conjunction so special is that they haven't been this close for almost 300 years, and they're not going to be this close again for another 800 years. So if you've been paying attention to the news in December, they were hyping this thing all month long. So I had plans to both view and photograph this conjunction, and in doing so, I brought three telescopes with me, the Takahashi FC-76, the Mead ETX-90, and the Celestron C-6. I chose these three telescopes because of their segmentation in focal lengths, 600, 1250, and 1500. Now, if I was just going to go look at the conjunction, I probably could have gotten by with just one telescope, and if I had to pick one of them, it probably would have been the C6. With a telescope, if you want to change the magnification, all you do is swap out eyepieces. But those of you who've done imaging know this is not quite so simple. The best way to achieve different magnifications in imaging is simply to bring another telescope and then use them essentially as telephoto lenses. You may also ask why I didn't go any higher than 1500 millimeters. Why didn't I bring, for example, an 8 inch Schmidt Cassegrain with a 2000 millimeter focal length? Well, it's been my experience that when planets are that low in the sky, I cannot, at least from this location, get anywhere near that focal length and get usable images. They just get too fuzzy. So my normal tactic is to start with the shortest focal length telescope. This would be the 76 at 600 millimeters. If the images are sharp, then I'll move up to the 1250 and so forth. And I was pretty sure I wasn't going to be able to use the C6 at 1500 millimeters, especially with the planetary imagers that I use. The crop factor on those things is enormous considering how small the chip sizes are. Now, if you're curious, this is what the planetary imagers look like. They're pretty small. This one is a color, and this one is a black and white. There are many different models out there. I use the ones from ZWO, but you can choose whichever ones you like. Now, it's a bit of a misconception that you had to be there just on the 21st to see this conjunction. In fact, those two planets have been getting close to each other for several months now, and I had been out at that observing field for several days beforehand, scouting out the location and getting images as test runs. 
In fact, one of the best images I got was from December the 15th, which was six days before the actual conjunction itself. Those of you who have actually shot Jupiter and Saturn know that there is an immediate problem. Jupiter is much, much brighter than Saturn. So what exposure are you going to use? It seems that no matter what exposure you pick for one planet, the other one is going to be severely under or overexposed. So the compromise is to find an exposure that is between the correct ones for both of them, and then you sort of tweak the levels and the brightness and the contrast to get them to look acceptable. It never completely seems right. An alternate method is to take pictures of the planets individually at their correct exposures. For example, here's one that I took of Jupiter on December the 15th. Then I stopped everything, refocused on Saturn, changed the exposure and the gain, and took the second image. Then what you do is you get a picture of what they're supposed to look like, the separation and the angles and so forth. You go into Photoshop or some other image editing software, and then you place them so that they're in their correct positions. This is what I did here. So on the night of the conjunction, I went to my local hilltop where we usually go observing, and the place was packed. Unfortunately, not only was it cloudy, but it was one of the worst observing condition nights I've ever seen. We had something like 12 to 14 inches of snow a few days earlier. It warmed up and all of that stuff started evaporating. The result was the entire area was covered in this sort of cold, foggy mist. So I talked to some people, I set up the C6, I took a picture of the C6 on the mount, and this picture that you're seeing here, I only had the telescope out for a few minutes. It got covered in frost and in dew. So we told people to come back the next day. Many of them did. The next night was much better. The problem is the skies were completely clear except for one patch on the western horizon covering up Jupiter and Saturn. In other words, the one part of the sky we wanted to look at was covered in clouds. Uh, so I set up the FC-76 here, and I showed people the moon, I showed them Mars and some of the brighter deep sky objects, just waiting for that cloud to move away. When it finally did move away, the planets were very low on the horizon, which of course is the worst possible place to shoot them. Here's a picture of the FC-76 pointed at Jupiter. You can see that Jupiter is a little bit out of focus there on the left side. But look how low the telescope it is. It is almost horizontal. So I went ahead and tried this anyway on the color imager, and I'm going to go ahead and show you just how bad the conditions were. This is the video capture that I took. There are 500 individual frames here. The idea is that some of those will be blurry. Well, in this case, most of them will be blurry, but the frame rate is high enough that you will catch occasional good moments of seeing, and you can run this video file through a program. We use either Registax or AutoStackert, and the software throws away the blurry images. I suspect most of these got thrown out. If there are any sharp ones in there, they pick them out and stack them, and then you can do some processing afterwards. It's really an ingenious process. But you really kind of do need a good video capture, and I wasn't hopeful on this one. But after I got home, I played with this, and this was the image that I got. And here's an illustration showing just how fast these planets were moving in relationship to one another. These are three pictures taken about a week apart, and you notice on the one on the right, that's December the 22nd, the day after the conjunction, Saturn and Jupiter have swapped places. And just as an aside, I've had people ask me this, how do we know when it's a good time to go observing? Well, there are two resources that we use online. One of them is the clear sky clock, and there's a sample forecast here. The timeline moves left to right. And very general terms, the blue boxes are good and the white boxes are not good. There's a second newer one that's come out called Astrospheric, and it gives you a little bit more information, but it's pretty much the same principle. Your timeline moves left to right and it gives you a forecast. Blue boxes are good, white boxes are not good. And by the way, these are not professional organizations. These are amateurs running this by themselves out of their own pockets. You see a lot of that in this hobby. But anyway, almost everyone I know uses at least one of these two services. So if you do wind up using these on a regular basis, do consider giving them a small donation. 
I know that some of you live in places like Arizona and New Mexico and West Texas where you have clear skies many, many nights of the year with no humidity and you can see clear right down to the horizon. So I know some of you got better results than I got here. So please feel free to share what you got and share your experiences as well. Other than that, I'll see you all in 20 years. I don't want to think about how old I'm going to be then, but perhaps we'll all meet back then and technology will have improved so that we don't have to go through some of this stuff. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks for watching and I'll see you soon.